In this video, I'm going to show you a system you can use to get a first in your maths degree with just four hours of work per day. Hi, my name is Harry and I'm a PhD student at the University of Bath. Last year, I graduated top of my class of almost 300 students and using everything I learned along the way, I'd like to help you do better in your maths degree. Okay, this super efficient system I'm going to show you is based on five principles. Understanding, spaced repetition, active recall, problem solving, and mental and physical well-being. If you haven't seen my video, How to be really good at maths, watch that first and it will give you a better idea of why this system works. So this system is based on the 80-20 principle, which says that 80% of the results of something comes from 20% of the inputs. And this phenomenon is found in all different aspects of the world. So for example, 80% of crimes are committed by 20% of criminals. 80% of company results come from 20% of the employees. And 20% of factories cause 80% of pollution. And as a result, 20% of your studying results in 80% of your grade. So this four hour per day system uses this principle to look at the most effective study techniques and just do those and nothing else. It cuts out everything that isn't effective in doing better in your exams. So four hours a day gives us 28 hours to work with. So let's break down where we're gonna put those 28 hours. Okay, so you're gonna to wanna to spend 10 hours a week on lecture notes. So during my undergraduate at the University of Bath, we had five modules each with two lectures per week. So for each lecture, you want to print out the lecture notes so you can write on them and draw diagrams, which will help with understanding. And then you're gonna to wanna to spend one hour going through understanding them and making flashcards using the software application Anki. If you don't know how to use Anki, I've got a playlist with the basics to have a look at that first. The course at the University of Bath is generally considered quite intense. So you may need less than an hour, you may need more, but adapt accordingly. This approach to lecture notes uses three of our five principles space repetition, active recall, and understanding. So you're in charge of the understanding. You need to make sure you go through the lecture notes and understand them. And Anki will handle the space repetition and active recall. I didn't mention before, but active recall is the process of remembering things, bringing them forward in your mind. And research has shown that that's the best, or well, one of the best ways you can remember information. And space repetition is the most efficient way to keep memories in your mind. So for each memory you want to keep, you have to space out the recalling of that memory over time. And like that, you can spend less time studying, but have better retention of memory because you only review the information every now and again, but at set intervals. It's important to note that you shouldn't make flashcards of content that you don't understand. If you don't understand something in the lecture notes, then wait for a few weeks, make a note of it and come back to it a few weeks later. And by then you'll have a better understanding of the course and the wider reason for why that bit of information might be there. And so you might be able to figure out why you don't understand it. So you're gonna to wanna to make flashcards for all the key bits of inf information in the lecture notes. So this is definitions, theorems, and small proofs, and maybe other bits as well, like remarks. If you come across a long proof, then try and understand the key points and a general idea of the proof. And if you have time, make a flashcard, but if not, just try and understand the general idea. This will make it a lot easier to memorize when you come to revising for your exam. Although generally you don't have to memorize the super long proofs in order to get a first, or not all of them anyway. Okay, every day, preferably first thing, you're gonna spend one hour reviewing the flashcards you've made. Reviewing flashcards is very energy intense so make sure you're fresh and you're you don't have brain fog or anything like that before you start reviewing your flashcards and make sure you won't be distracted either however reviewing your flashcards is the most important part of this process regularly coming back to bits of material in the lecture notes at set intervals really helps to memorize lots of the content of the lecture in other words we're going to use active recall and space repetition every day for an hour and these are the big guns of studying and remembering stuff and doing well in your exams. The biggest challenge in this step is figuring out how to set up Anki so that it takes you roughly an hour each day to review your flashcards. To do this, you're gonna to have to experiment with the number of new cards Anki lets you see each day. 
If you're confused about what I'm talking about, then go and have a look at my playlist about making flashcards for your maths degree. If for some reason you don't have much time that day, your priority should be reviewing your flashcards. If you miss one day, then your reviews stack up and your space repetition, which is when you're supposed to be reviewing a card or a bit of information, gets thrown out of whack and you lose a lot of the effort you've already put in. So if you've only got one hour in a day, make sure the only thing you do is your flashcards. So at the University of Bath, we had five problem sheets a week, one for each module, and each one took between an hour and, well, forever to finish. So you'll need to adapt the following ideas to the quantity and difficulty of the problem sheets at your university. Here's what I recommend for doing your problem sheets. Limit it to two hours per problem sheet and split it over two or three sessions. So why just two hours? If you spend more than two hours on your problem sheet, the return on your effort starts to diminish. The two, first two hours is perhaps the most fruitful in terms of gain for your understanding. And after that, the problems are probably too difficult and take too much time for it to be worth your effort trying to solve them. Remember, we're trying to make the most efficient study system possible. So we want the maximum returns on our study efforts. It's important that the questions you're looking at are just outside of your comfort zone. That's where the most gains can be had. And I think setting a two hour cap on each problem sheet prevents you wasting time on problems that are too difficult. If you do get stuck on a problem and can't finish it, then make a note of it and come back to it a few weeks later or when you come to revise. So why not one block of two hours? Why does it have to be two or three sessions? So in my video, it has to be really good at maths. I talked about the difference between diffuse mode thinking and focus mode thinking. And if you haven't seen that video, I give you a super quick crash course. So focus mode thinking is what you think thinking is. This is where you're thinking about something. And diffuse mode thinking is when your subconscious is working on a problem or looking at ideas in the back of your mind while you're not directly thinking about it and you're doing something else. Diffuse mode thinking looks at the big picture. And long story short, the interplay between these two systems and switching between these two modes increases the chance of solving a problem. It improves your problem solving. Thus, we want to work on problem sheets over a few sessions in order to benefit from this switching between modes. And once you've done more than two or three sessions, then you start to lose benefits because you don't have enough time to even comprehend the question or start to form an idea of how to answer it. Finally, there's two different ways you can approach when you do your problem sheets. So if your university offers a marking and return system with a deadline, then perhaps this first approach is best for you. Do your problem sheets as and when you get them and hand them in before the deadline. This has two main benefits. Number one, an enforced deadline helps you stay disciplined and encourages you to do your problem sheets. And number two, you'll get marked feedback from a tutor and then you can jot down which questions you've misunderstood, which allows you to prioritize come revision time. The second approach is to do your problem sheets after the solutions have already come out. And this has one main benefit and one main drawback. The main benefit is you'll be able to look at the solutions when the problem is fresh in your mind and you'll more easily be able to understand the solution and more easily be able to see where you've gone wrong. But the major drawback is it's super easy to cheat and also super easy to convince yourself that you understand the solution or how to do a question just by looking at the answer. Looking at the solution and convincing yourself that you understand a solution when you don't is a dangerous game to play. And if you think you're gonna do this or you think you're gonna cheat, then go for the first approach where you hand them in before the solutions are released and get feedback from your tutor. Personally, I used the first approach. It meant I was more likely to spend time on my problem sheet. Even if you don't answer all the questions or only answer a few, hand your problem sheet anyway. Make the deadline sacred so that it has more power over you in the future and encourages you to spend more time on your problem sheets. In my experience as a tutor, most students don't hand their problem sheets anyway. So even if you answer a few questions and hand it in, then you're ahead of most people in your cohort. Okay, so that's how the system allocates four hours a day to get the most returns on your study effort. The mathematicians amongst you, which is probably all of you, may have noticed that that only adds up to 27 hours. So with your free hour, I recommend doing the following things in order of priority. So review extra flashcards. I think flashcards has the most return on effort in terms of study time. And this is useful as well in the early days when you haven't quite set up Anki correctly 
and so you need a bit more time to review your flashcards. So number two, spend more time understanding your lecture notes. Number three, spend more time on your problem sheets. And number four, take a nap. Sleeping is great for memory recall. Okay, so you have 140 more hours to work with each week and you can do with them as you please. But your four hours of study per day is gonna be intense. And so you need to be in top form. You need to have great mental and physical well-being in order to be there and be present and study hard for your four hours a day. So I recommend using at least some of your free hours to work on your mental and physical well-being in order to improve the four hours that you're putting into study per day. So research shows that fitness correlates strongly to exam performance and intelligence. In fact, when you exercise, your brain releases a chemical which encourages the growth of new brain cells. So literally running grows brain cells. And also research shows that sleep is vitally important for forming new memories. Your physical and mental well-being are strongly interlinked, but there's a number of things you can do to also target your mental well-being. These include using your free time to spend time with other people, socializing, volunteering for a cause you find meaningful, which helps you find meaning and purpose in your life, and also spending time in nature. In fact, there's a Japanese word which literally translates as forest bathing. And in one of my favorite scientific results, forest bathing or being in nature improves your mental well-being. So literally just standing in a forest bathing in trees improves your mental well-being. That's it. All you have to do is stand in a forest and it's healthy for your brain. In particular, a study in the Netherlands showed that there's a correlation between the number of green space within a three kilometer radius of your house and the number of health complaints and your perceived health. Okay, so when should you do your four hours of study per day? It's best not to do them in one big block because our mental energy is a finite resource and we want to be on top form when we sit down to do some of our study. Breaking them up throughout the day also increases the number of times we swap between diffuse mode thinking and focus mode thinking, which as we know, is great for understanding. So for example, perhaps you want to work 10 a.m. to 11 a.m., take an hour's break, then do 12 till one and take lunch as a reward. And then do four till five, take a break from five to six and then do six to seven and have dinner as a reward. In turn, this reward increases motivation, the reward of food, and increases the chance that you will form the habit of studying at the times you've chosen. It's best to trial and figure out when to do these four hours. Perhaps you want to do five or six hours a day and take the weekends completely off. So try it out and figure out what works best for you. But once you've decided, try and make them as sacred as possible. By that, I mean, turn off your phone, set a timer for an hour and or for however long you want to study and make sure that during that hour you're just studying. I use an application called Freedom. I think I paid 15 pounds for a year subscription. I'll put a link in the description below. And what Freedom does is it blocks websites and time wasters on my laptop and on my phone. So it's virtually impossible for me to do anything but study. If you do decide to use Freedom, make sure you tick disable quitting during sessions because this makes it impossible for you to change your mind and cancel freedom and go back to wasting your time on social media or YouTube or whatnot. Then you'll need to set up which applications and sites you'd like to block, the ones that you tend to waste time on, and then you can set a session for the length of your study period. So then when you're finished, you can reward yourself with these websites which again enforces the habit of your studying time. Your lecture notes and your problem sheet part of your study may require some research. So if that's the case, perhaps block everything for some of your sessions and leave designated sessions where you research things that you need to find. But when you're making your flashcards, you can block everything because you don't need anything but your lecture notes and a computer. Also take as many precautions as you can to avoid distractions. If you really enforce these habits of studying early on, eventually they'll get to a point where it will hit 10 o'clock when you usually study and you'll start to get twitchy because usually you're at your desk or in the library studying at that time. Okay, so some caveats and alterations to this system. So this system is very extreme and really just cuts out everything that 
seems non-essential and so you get the most reward for your effort. If you're unsure by this, perhaps try it with one of your modules, perhaps early on in your degree, when it's worth less towards your degree result, and see how you fare in this module compared to your other modules, or perhaps spend more than four hours a day and add in some of the more conventional ways of studying into your system. If you do decide to do this, I recommend attending tutorials first or workshops, these are active learning environments and I think you get more out of them for the time invested. And you can always go with questions you have from your lecture notes to get even more out of these, out of these tutorials or workshops. You may have noticed that this system excludes going to lectures. If this makes you unsure, then have a look at my video, should you bother attending lectures or not? And use that to decide whether you think it's worth your time going to the lectures on top of the efficient things we've already discussed. You may come across some problems with the system and the main problem I can foresee is that your university doesn't provide lecture notes before the lecture or at all. If this is the case, I recommend pestering the department until they give you lecture notes or maybe even bring up the study I mentioned in my video, should we bother with lectures about the inefficiency of traditional lecturing? Actually, that's probably a bad idea. No, don't do that. If that fails, you still do have some options. If your lectures are recorded, you can use them instead of type lecture notes and you could just write down questions and draw diagrams in a separate book. Or you could ask a friend, a super nice friend to give you the lecture notes every lecture. Although this will put you a few days behind the course, which means you'll have less time to study. Then again, you'll be using such an efficient system that you're likely to be miles ahead anyway. Okay, what do you think of this system? Is it too extreme for you? let me know in the comment section below but thanks for watching if you found this useful then please give me a like and if you want to see more like this then please subscribe and if you like my t-shirt there's a link in the description below of where you can buy one they're made by my mom so all the profits go towards giving her a living wage and also towards supporting the channel you may also like my last two videos which are about how to get 100 percent in a math exam and how to make the most of lectures if you do decide to go to lectures.